Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I went through a slideshow very similar to the, the PowerPoint that I'm going to be showing today. I've added some things to that. Um, so we'll just take a look through this and try to get you informed uh, as well as we can. Um, to start with here, uh, just something light, something they're doing new uh, from what I understand with the stop signs in the area. We'll see how well that goes, see how that flies. I'm a trooper, as she said, I'm Trooper Aaron Shaw with the Indiana State Police Commercial Motor Vehicle Division. Um, I've uh, been with the department since 2001 and uh, in 2010 I came on with the Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Division, just worked the road midnights prior to that. So been with uh, CVED as it's called, Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Division since 2010. Um, in that time seen a lot of things uh, regarding big rigs, heavy equipment, um, hauling, working out there on the roadways with um, large-scale equipment, things that are uh, just as fast uh, going down the highway but, but way bigger, way heavier than your common passenger car and pickup truck. Things that basically what I'm getting at is require a higher level of awareness and a higher level of attention given to uh, the equipment, the mechanics, the, the service and repair of that kind of thing, and then also the paperwork part of it, driver condition, um, making sure certifications are up, making sure that uh, licensing is correct, making sure that weights are correct. We'll, uh, we'll be CDL we're going to start with. We're going to talk about CDL uh, requirements. Um, ELD, the electronic logs, um, which from what I understand don't apply to most of you but may apply to some of you so we're just going to touch on that a little briefly and just general hours of service um, requirements as well as some exemptions for that which like I say most of you probably fall under with the construction and, and or staying local uh, and then load securement is one of the biggest issues we see out there is uh, loads shifting loads not secured at all uh, and accidents compounding themselves because of that. As you well know, we deal with basically two sides of this law book, law book wise. We've got the state law book, we've got the federal law book. Uh, the FMCSRs, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, are what the federal government's come up with uh, through studies, through examinations of traffic and through accidents um, to say that the commercial hauler needs to abide by these. All of you, 100% of you, fall within all the state regulations, but there's some of you who may or may not fall under those federal regulations as far as enforcement by us out on the roadside or in a compliance review or a safety audit. Um, so I like to talk a little bit about those differences. Uh, what you haul and what size you are and where you're hauling it has quite a bit to do with which regulations you fall under officially. The, again, um, with respect to what we enforce out there on the roadside. But to start with, uh, I'll clear the air on this. Um, this was circulating on Facebook not too long ago and some other, you know, just online, and I've been asked at prior PIOs, is that me in the picture? And it is not me in the picture, I'll just confirm that, uh, as much as it does look like me. Uh, if it were a tank of coffee, I might have been a little bit more upset than I am in this situation, but um, you can see the patch there on his shoulders different from mine, so that confirms that and gets that out of the way. Uh, CDL requirements. So if you're in a single unit uh, that the uh, gross vehicle weight rating is 26,001 pounds or more, you're required the Class B CDL. I'm not even sure the CDL flow chart will pull this up. Uh, if, uh, but again, a single unit uh, with a 26,001 pound uh, gross vehicle weight rating or actual weight of the vehicle. So your GVWR, uh, your, your rating may be 19,000 pounds, but if you're loaded to the weight of 26,001 pounds or more, and I stop you on the roadside and put scales under you and that's how much you weigh, you'll be required the CDL, even though your weight rating or your declared registration weight may be under the 26,001. If you're at 26,001 or more, uh, you will be required the Class B CDL. Then you get into uh, your articulating units, two or more units, uh, a truck pulling a trailer. So if the gross combination weight rating of those two 
is 26,001 more or more pounds, uh, class B CDL also required. Uh, if the trailer of those two units is in excess of 10,001 pounds or more, class A CDL is then required. Um, single unit of any size or weight uh, in which 16 or more passengers, including the driver, uh, will be, are, are capable of, of, of uh, being transported, then the class CDL is required. And also with that is a placardable amount of hazardous materials on that truck, a class C CDL is also required. Um, so if you had your 26,001 pound box truck uh, carrying hazardous materials, you're now required the class B CDL. The C uh, classification covers your hazmat, uh, but the B classification would be required if you are over that 26,001 pound mark. Um, so that covers that. It's like I say, there's the flow chart available there. Um, keep track of what you're hauling and, and what your weight is, what your weight has the potential to be uh, to see if you should be in that CDL um, category or not. I've, I've get uh, quite a few times a two axle dump truck that's loaded. Uh, and like I say, GBWR might be 19,000 pounds, but he's carrying 33,000. Uh, once I put scales under him and weigh him. So not only is he likely over an axle weight as well, uh, but he's going to be required that Class B C CDL, and I see him just in a regular license or chauffeur's license quite a bit. So that places you out of service. If you're operating a, a unit that requires a level of CDL you do not have, or if your CDL's been uh, disqualified or revoked or is invalid for any reason, uh, you'll be placed out of service until the proper licensing is obtained. <clears throat> um, so licensing exemptions um, are what we see here, and some of this may or may not apply, but we do get into road construction or maintenance machinery, ditch digging apparatus, well drilling apparatus, or a concrete mixer uh, that's temporarily moved or propelled on a highway. Um, so what we're saying is on a job site situation, if you're within a section of the highway that you're working on, in, that would exempt you from the CDL. But as soon as you leave a job site area, you're then required that CDL again. Once you're on the travel portion of the highway that's not part of a job site, that gets you back in CDL requirements. We get asked sometimes if you're at the plant, say you're at the, uh, a facility with a large parking lot and you're making circles around the facility, maybe doing deliveries, picking things up or whatever, um, can you have someone jump in that tractor trailer combination or, or combination vehicle and make runs around the facility without going on the travel portion, the public roadways? A CDL is not required, again, on that private property, on that premises, until you hit the roadway. So if you leave one exit and go out on a, on a roadway, go around the block and in a separate exit, you were, during that portion you're on the roadway, you're required the CDL and you're required the CDL uh, endorsement and or status level A, B, or C for whichever it is you're hauling. So full-blown semi-tractor trailer uh, that's hauling hazmat, you'll need the Class A CDL for that to go out on the roadway and go around the block and back into the, the facility. Uh, but again, on the private property, on the actual facility premises, you're not, you're not required it. Okay, there's some hazmat apparently being hauled by you guys from time to time. It's not the biggest uh, issue with you guys, but I do, like I say, we do touch on it. And the hazardous materials, uh, any, any placardable, a placardable amount of hazmat, um, so for class, uh, for table one items, um, that's anything, that's going to be your explosives, uh, your radioactive materials and poisonous gases are listed on there. There's a couple tables. Uh, I don't have them in a slideshow, but basically table one, any amounts required a placard. But that's going to fall under this 119 gallon uh, rule. In other words, 119 gallons or more rating uh, will require that to be placarded. Um, so that, that's that part of it. Let's skip down. <clears throat> then with hazmat, if we stop you and you are a hazmat carrier, um, to do an inspection on your, on your vehicle and you, your load and the, the driver conditions. There's going to be certain things with uh, a hazmat carrier that's required 
uh, under federal law that aren't with your standard hauler. Um, so with your paperwork, that bill of lading, uh, to start with, I'm going to give a prior point before these, that your, all your paperwork required with a hazardous materials load has to be accessible. Uh, yeah, that actually is, is the second line there. Uh, all your paperwork, your documents have to be accessible prior to taking the seatbelt off. So if I get up in your window and you pop the seatbelt open and reach over and pull your MSDS sheets uh, or your um, hazardous materials response guidebook out from above the visor, but you're unbuckled, that's going to be a violation. You'll be written up for that. Um, same with your, you want to make sure your shipping papers. Um, that, that hazardous material related paperwork has to be accessible from the driver's seat with seat belt still on. So that's one that isn't, isn't necessarily super obvious and we do see it from time to time. Someone will pop that belt off and reach over to get something out of his reach. Uh, and we know that that was something he had to reach for too far and that, like I say, that does get written up. Um, let's continue down. Again, if something pops up question-wise, feel free to ask, but you can also take notes, ask them at the end when we have question and answer time at the end. Feel free to approach either of us separately when we're finished as well. If you would rather not speak to the group, we'll definitely stand by and answer any questions you have one-on-one. -on -one. I'm gonna reiterate something on the hazmat. Everyone, I'm not sure with specialties on this, but everyone that is driving an E&B that is a placarded vehicle, there is a laminated yellow card in that truck. That is your hazmat bill of lading. It has to be accessible from belted in the seat. The driver is responsible to make sure that he has all the paperwork he needs to leave the yard. That's license, registration, DOT physical card. In hazmat conditions, it's your bill of lading. In the distributors, it's your emergency response. Again, a yellow placarded card or laminated card in the truck. The driver is responsible to make sure it's there. You get stopped, say, oh, I don't know anything about it. Not a good answer. We try to make sure that everything's in that truck every spring. We DOT all these vehicles, but we're human too. It's your responsibility when you get in the truck, make sure you have everything you need. Okay, and with that, and it's good that you have the laminated fixed um, shipping paper. Uh, because that has to have specific things on it as well. Your hazardous materials, shipping papers uh, have to have, um, same as bill of lading, you have to show what it is you're carrying. And with hazmat, it has to be in detail, which would be the UN number, the packing group, um, the proper shipping name of the material. Uh, you'll also need to have where it's coming from and going to, uh, who the shipper of that is, uh, of that product. Um, as well as emergency contact information. So an 800 number um, that we would be able to contact if, if needed or some other roadside situation that if uh, we would know what that material is and the best way to deal with it. Uh, so those things have to be on that form and that form has to be in possession. The actual form, we're not gonna accept a emailed or texted photograph uh, from a boss or something like that. If you don't have the actual form with you, uh, then that will be a, a violation also. Uh, let me move on here. So for ELD, this, this thing that's come about in the last couple of years now, um, most companies are, are fully on board with it. Not everybody's super happy with it as we saw a week ago or so with um, the whole slow roll around 465. Um, and that is needed for drivers that go beyond the 100 air miles, eight or more days in a 30-day rolling calendar, and that's, for, that's vehicle specific. So a company may have 10 vehicles, but two of those uh, go outside of that 100 air miles in eight or more days in a 30-day period. And so those two vehicles would be required ELD. Uh, the ELD is never required if you are not required to, to maintain logs. So that's why the, the 100 air miles is there. If you're a short hauler, uh, if, if you do short hauls under the 100 air miles or in farming or non-CDL, if it's under 150 air miles, you're not required the log book, so therefore you're not required ELDs. Um, again, from what I understand, that doesn't apply to very many of you, but uh, something definitely to keep in mind as you move forward and possibly branch out into other types of work and different things come up. Um, Overall, though, in the last year, the service, the hours of service regulations have not 
changed to a, to a great de degree or anything we need to uh, necessarily cover. But the e as far as the ELD goes, again, there's no exemption for construction companies either. If, if, again, if you're required the logs, then you are required ELD outside of that 100 air miles. Um, there's a few exemptions that wouldn't apply to you, such as drive away, tow away, uh, some things like that. But as, as far as it applies to, to you drivers here, uh, this is what you're, you'll be concerned with. Uh, so the hours of service, the 11 hour rule, you can't drive beyond 11 hours in a day. Um, only counts drive time. So if we stop you and you have in, your, in today or the previous seven days, if you've got 11 hours driven uh, without a 10 hour rest break and, you're, and you show any drive time beyond that, uh, then that's going to be a violation for you. If you're in violation at the time we stop you, uh, then you're placed out of service for a minimum of 10 hours. The 14 hour rule includes uh, driving and on duty not driving. And as well as off duty or sleeper berth less than two hours. So any, if you spend an hour in your sleeper berth and that's part of a total block of time, 14 hours or more, and then you show drive time beyond that before a 10 hour rest break, uh, that is going to be a violation. Then the 30 minute rule, uh, which is for eight straight hours of either driving or off duty, if you show drive time beyond that without taking a 30 minute rest period, that is also a violation and that, can, that has to be a solid 30 minutes. There can't be 15 minutes within the first four hours and then 15 in the second four, putting those together to make 30. It has to be a solid block of time, 30 minutes or more uh, with you either off duty or in the sleeper berth. So you want to be outside of your duties of, of uh, being on duty. If, if you are pulling into a lot and helping offload materials or preparing a load for travel, load securement like we're going to go over pretty soon, that's not going to count as a 30 minute rest period. You want to be separated from work related duties of any kind. <coughs> Then uh, some more exem exemptions, and I think I covered some of this, but operating within a 100 air mile radius of your normal work reporting location. So your normal work reporting location is where you're based out of. If you guys uh, take a trip as a group to a certain lo uh, work site location and set up at a, a hotel or accommodations of some kind there for a week, say, for a couple days or a week, and you report daily to a job site from that location, then that's going to become your normal work port reporting location. Um, so like, like we had covered, most of you are going to be exempt from the majority of these since you would be operating within that. I doubt at any point you're going to stay at a place 100 miles from where you're working on a daily basis. So if you're not traveling outside of that 100 air miles, uh, you're going to fall under the exemption. The construction exemption Staying within that 100 air miles on a daily basis from your normal work reporting location exempts you from the logs. Uh, if you go outside of the 100 air miles for a particular trip, that day is going to require logs and you will need to be able to show that the previous seven days did not. So basically one log could say from days one through seven, uh, we were on short haul and didn't require logs. I mean, that, that can be worded just to cover that and then your current day, whatever day it is you're on. So that's on a day when you know you'll be outside of that 100 air miles for, the, for that trip. Uh, any trip that's, that you're required to be out of the 100 air miles on, you want to show a log for that trip for that day. You want to show your drive time and work time for that. That's for purposes of roadside inspection. When we stop you, we're going to be saying where are you coming from, where are you going to, and we're going to be looking at whether or not you have logs and whether or not you're required to have them. Um, Beyond that, the company does, and I think the next slide covers this. Okay, I might come back to that. Um, get down to here. Okay, so for your construction exemption, um, intrastate only is what exempts you from the logs as construction employees. Uh, as soon as you cross state lines and go beyond that 100 air miles both, that's going to put you back in the log regulations. You're going to be required a log on the roadside. Again, that's 
uh, outside of the 100 air miles and crossing state lines, uh, you'll, be, you'll be required that. So if you are in the construction capacity and staying in state, you are going to be exempt from logs. But as soon as you go outside of state and you are outside of the 100 air miles, you are required logs. It's, there's a lot to it, I understand. And there's a great big book, like I say, we're covered under a state level book. But, th but this logs is all part of an even much larger federal level book. So I understand questions might come out of that, but feel free to, to hit us up anytime and we can hopefully give you better clarification on it if it's needed. Um, so there are examples, like I say, of the short haul exemption. Um, Non-CDL drivers, again, if they operate within 150 air miles of the normal work reporting location. Uh, farming falls under that, but we, as it, as it applies to you all, um, if you're a non-CDL driver within that 150, you're going to be exempt unless you, uh, as soon as you get over that 150 and go out of state, then you're required to keep logs. Um, and I'll back up to this because there is a, actually here, uh, you may, this is here, you may use one 16 hour day as provided below. So there's some caveats to that. Uh, and that's that the driver has begun and ended each of the previous five day tours at the uh, normal work reporting location. Uh, the driver may use one 16 hour day following 10 hours off. Uh, and that's if you have not already taken this exemption within the previous six consecutive days. Uh, it gets a little, a little bit detailed there, but basically uh, if you've not taken that 16 hour day for six days and you've completed a 10 hour rest period, you can take that 16 hour day. Um, so that's when you start a new seven or eight day consecutive period uh, with the beginning of any off duty period of 34 or more consecutive hours and 34 hour restart. Again, I think this will, from what I understand, 99.9% .9 of you, this will not affect. But if it does, and if you question it at all, feel free to get with us afterwards. We'll talk about it some more. Um, so then the non-CDL driver can actually utilize two 16 hour days uh, and they're exempt from the 30 minute rule break. Uh, again, that's the non-CDL holders among you. Um, and what further into this is that logs, your, your time has to be kept track of as a company. So you do still need to keep track of your time, time worked, time driving, but that uh, doesn't have to be with you roadside when we stop you. When we stop you for an inspection or for a traffic violation in either or, we're not going to say uh, contact your company and we need to get your history of, of uh, hours. Uh, we're only checking roadside logs when they're required, which is when you're outside of the 100 air miles and in your case, crossing state lines. Other than that, we're not going to be asking you for the log book, but in a, com in a compliance review or safety audit situation, the company will need to show uh, the history of your hours. Uh, I'll get into a little bit later about accidents and uh, post crash, but that is another example where uh, your hours are going to be scrutinized heavily is in accident situations. Uh, you may not be required to keep the logs with you on, on roadside necessarily, but if there's an accident involved, we are definitely going to be um, pursuing looking into the history of the hours that you've got. Uh, so again, yeah, if you guys leave the state, that puts you back in the regulations for logs, as long as you're outside of that 100 air miles for CDL, uh, 150 for non-CDL. Uh, let me touch too on medical card because it is somewhat of a common misconception that you're required to keep the long form medical card with you at all times. Uh, CDL holders are not currently required to carry any type of medical card with them uh, because we can look those up. We have access to be able to uh, look those up separate from the card. So the card doesn't have to be kept unless you're a non-CDL driver. If you're uh, strictly in driving, but in a non-CDL capacity, depending on again, what your weight is or gross vehicle weight rating is, uh, you will actually still need to carry that medical card because we don't have a way to look up non-CDL drivers. We can only access the medical card history of CDL drivers. So that's something is, uh, I get asked do you, on traffic stops, do you want my medical card? Uh, well, if, if it's a tractor trailer or whatever, I don't, don't need it because we can't look those up. 
So what I go into now is uh, securement of vehicles. And this says what are rules for securing heavy vehicles, equipment and machinery. Um, but anything you put on a trailer or in the bed of a truck has to be secured, heavy or not, it's, it's all relevant. Um, some of it more than others, but, but uh, if, it's, if it's on your vehicle, it needs to be secured. It needs to be prevented from forward, rearward, lateral, or side to side, and upwards movement. Um, if in a crash, things can leave your vehicle and, and go and do damage heavily, heavily, you know, more heavy damage to other vehicles, they need to be secured and made immobile. Uh, that's really the basics of it, but as we get into detail, you see that heavy machinery uh, of, of a weight of 10,000 pounds or more um, get a little special detail with regard to securement in that they are required actually four tie downs for those, for those vehicles. You want four points of contact and you want those points of contact to be uh, on the front corner most portions and on the rear corner most portions. Um, for an item less than 10,000 pounds, you only need two tie downs, but again, you're gonna wanna go from the front most portion of the item to the rear most. Uh, you're not gonna have a tractor with just two rear tie downs and the front doesn't have a tie down. By weight, you, you have the proper amount, but you want those evenly spaced. It's, it's mostly common sense stuff, really, when it comes to tie downs. Uh, without getting into the details on that, it's just, if it's there, we need to secure it. Um, and so some people don't always adhere to that. So I like to throw this up there because it's out there, we see it. This is why we talk about this kind of thing and why we're out there enforcing it is because this is Joe, construction guy, who's left a job site on one end of town and gone through town to try to get to the other job site where he's just gonna park it and maybe detach the, the truck and head to lunch real quick and then come back and start on the second job. And he doesn't have time to take the chains, uh, which are in fact in the bed, come to find out he's got the tie downs in, his, in the bed of his truck. But, you know, the gravity is gonna hold it there. It's heavy enough, it won't go anywhere. I'm just going through town a few miles. Um, but as I cover a little more here pretty soon, uh, there's, there's definitely more he could do there to minimize liability and damage and, and injury, surely, in the event that 90-year-old grandma runs through the stoplight and smashes into him and he's done everything perfectly traffic wise but he gets hit and then this becomes you know whatever it is an eight or ten thousand pound bowling ball rolling across the highway doing all kinds of damage <clears throat> so we see it it's out there and there's there's we may see a flatbed like this with just a huge pile of gravel sitting on it um, some i've seen guys put a toe strap uh, or a securement strap, nylon webbing, over the center of a pile of gravel on a flatbed trailer. I should have come up with a picture of that because there's one of those online too. Uh, this is actually one I found up in Kokomo. Um, but yeah, it's, it's fairly common to say, we're just gonna put it there and hope we don't get hit. It's a couple miles. But as soon as you do get hit, as soon as that crash happens, you know, companies go out of business and lives are lost and lives are changed forever because of that. Uh, and all it would have taken is, um, depending on weight, two or four straps there, or, or chains rather, to lock that thing down and make it safer. Jump in on this one too. As he's talking about the chaining, E and B requires a four point tie down on everything. We don't care about the weight, it's four point. And I don't think he's got on to uh, the Lent Wong stuff. Do you have a spot in there for? The 10 foot and over? And the, and the, yes, yeah. the length on the tie downs. But he just said something about companies going out of business. Every one of you have seen the billboards. He's everywhere. There's more of the hammer billboards out there than there are Sea Rock City signs. And it's all about big truck. Keller and Keller, Morgan and Morgan. They're all out there and they're all saying big truck. The reason is, guys, there are so many regulations for what we're doing out here in the big trucks, that they're looking for any undotted I or uncrossed T that makes us not legal to be where we were at that point in time. If we're not legal to be there, we are automatically at fault. That's how they make their millions. I, you guys can be held criminally liable behind the seat of the truck. 
It's not just the company, it is the driver. We had an incident in Kentucky two years ago. We were turning left, setting in, in, in the road, turning left. A lady parked it underneath the rear of the low boy and got dead. Before we got the accident report, we had a wrongful death lawsuit paperwork at Anderson. That's how this works. Morgan & Morgan filed a wrongful death lawsuit for the injured party before they even talked to the relatives. So they figured they could do it. We got out of that one, we were golden, but that's, that's what it's all about. We're not here just trying to protect the company, we're trying to protect you guys because you can be held liable, you're behind the wheel of the truck. Um, so yeah, we, we do like to stress that and, and we like to show the right way to do it as well, which in this case, um, an accident just like the kind we're speaking of in, uh, in which a pickup pulling a boat trailer, uh, this was up on uh, US 24 at State Road 19 in Miami County. Um, so pick up pulling a boat trailer, a uh, gentleman and his grandson turn uh, on the red light. So they did not have right of way. This um, truck had the right of way coming uh, east on 24, had the green, comes through, does, does what he's supposed to. Here comes pick up with trailer, turns in front of him, and there actually used to be a boat on that trailer. It's actually on the other side of the truck where you can't see it. This did end up being a double fatality for the individuals in the pickup truck. Uh, but this hauler is left behind. But what we see here is, as he is, you know, we found no violations with him. I did the level one follow-up, and he had done everything just right. And you can see his securement straps here, what he's doing. Um, he was successful in securing that down and making it the way it needed to be. But say the previous uh, photo had the same incident, uh, that, that tractor's gonna go flying, and who knows, vehicles, uh, these are, we'd have vehicles one and two involved here, but we could have vehicles three or four or more involved with regard to something like that flying down the highway. Um, same thing with these blocks, is if they were to cut loose uh, and go flying, they're, they're gonna do some damage in addition to what's already been done in that crash. Um, so then it's a little bit small, but I, uh, there at the corner, it's kind of comical where this occurred. No one was injured in this one, but it's a shift of the load within that van trailer. Um, auto parts that were just on a pallet sitting there in the middle of the, of the van trailer that slid over to the side on this curve there, uh, east uh, west end of Marion in Grant County. Slides over and as he's taking the turn there, he just tips over. Um, it's a bad day and there's cleanup involved and um, product damaged, but it's an example of what, what's needed in that trailer that wasn't there, which is blocking and bracing, or again, just prevention from movement. If your uh, load is such that it can slide either direction and affect uh, your travel in any way, it needs to be immobilized. Um, blocking and bracing, straps, put it, you know, centermost in the, tra in the trailer as much as you can as far as lateral goes. Um, to secure that and make sure it's not gonna slide in an event like this. This is pretty common, trucks taking a curve and tipping, <clears throat> excuse me, tipping over due to a shift in the load and, and or taking that curve a little bit too quick. Obviously that's gonna be a factor. But if you, I don't know if you noticed there, but we can zoom in on the location of this, which is right in front of the driving academy. So that was <laughs> something that we took note of for sure. Um, we, he may have gone in and signed up for classes right after that, I'm not sure, but get back out oops okay so then we have some other examples of the right way to do it and essentially um, like I say 10,000 or more pounds needs to have four tie downs for the base part of that unit uh, then you get into articulating parts um, moving parts that are part of that unit um, backhoes buckets extendable you know the, your bucket trucks that extend out and also raise and lower uh, if it can move individually from the unit, it also needs to have its own securement device. Every one of these has two sheets. The best part of it is, is it is also a what to do in case of an accident. And on the back side of it, we have incident reports. There it is, line by line, everything you're gonna need. Being in an accident, stressful. I know, I've been there. 
There's things you forget. There's a piece of paper. The police officer most likely is going to ask you for the registration. You've got it right there. And here is your, here is your what to do list, literally line by line. We're going to ask the same things on the incident report. So there you go. All right. It's in there. Everybody has in this day and age, a cell phone with a camera, take pictures, any pictures, all pictures. They're wonderful. You don't need any kind of kit. You've got it. It's already in the truck. Every truck has it and uh, fill it out. It protects you. It protects us. It gets the information down. So back to, our, yeah, articulating pieces have to be secured. If it can move individually from the unit, it also has to have its own securement device. Uh, we see the example of the extending boom here with the bucket on the end of it. Uh, that, that extension piece needs to be made immobile from being able to be extended. Uh, there can be uh, any type of strapping that holds that in place, or if there's a pin that can be inserted that holds that in place by the manufacturer, uh, then that's acceptable as well. But that has to be prevented from any movement that it could possibly make in addition to the central piece. Uh, same thing with the front loader there on the right also. Um, we see different uh, examples. Uh, articulating vehicles should be restrained in a manner that prevents articulation. If it can move, lock it down. It can be, like I say, any, any movable part can have a pin inserted if it's designed to have that. That does suffice, but again, make sure that it's touching, that it's lowered to its lowest point uh, to be um, in contact with the trailer and then pinned or, or secured in another manner. Um, we also discuss working load limits. Um, you want to make sure the total working load limit of your securement devices are at least, uh, at minimum, half of the weight of the, of the load that you're carrying. Uh, so if your skid loader is 10,000 pounds, you've got your four tie downs on it, all of those tie downs aggregate the, the total of those tie downs have to equal 5,000 pounds or more to cover that uh, that piece of equipment. Uh, and so that's not including your articulating piece uh, of securement as well. So your four main tie downs on the unit must be half or more of the total weight. And that's the total weight of the item itself, not the total gross weight of the vehicle that, that's hauling it, but just the item itself, whatever it weighs, half of that in working load limit. So if we come and inspect your tie downs, we're gonna be taking measurement tools and we're gonna see the width of those chains. We're gonna make sure those links aren't wore uh, to a certain extent. Uh, your chain's only as strong as your weakest link. So if uh, you may have a 5,000 pound aggregate uh, working load limit with chains, but if one link in one of those chains is bad uh, in, the, in the secured portion of the chain, then that chain might as well not be there. And now all of a sudden you have three tie downs when you need four and that's going to be out of service till something else is placed on it. Uh, make sure those tie downs are in good working condition and that they're marked with the uh, working load limit that we need to see. If they're not marked, if they're old and wore out and we can't read the rating that's on them, uh, we will be giving you the least amount possible of rating. We'll be looking at the lowest possible chain size uh, to default that chain to um, when we go to inspect that and make sure your weights are proper on your securement. So yeah, anything that can move on tracks, if, it's, uh, if it can roll forward or backward, or uh, it has to be secured against movement from the lateral forward, rearward, and vertical direction using a minimum of four tie downs with your 10,000 pound items. <coughs> Just some more examples of, of uh, things tied down. When you're using nylon webbing, um, in any example, you will want to make sure you have edge protection. Make sure that webbing's not rubbing up against rock uh, that can wear that web, webbing out in any given trip and cause it to, uh, to not be applicable. Uh, if that wears the webbing out in transit, then that shows that should have had edge protection. So just some smooth form of caps that can be placed over the load but under the webbing that protects that webbing from rubbing against something abrasive that can, can damage it. While he's on that, just so you know, everything that E&B buys, and I'm assuming specialties, is the same as grade 70 transport chain. It has a 6,600 pound working limit. We don't go to TSC, we don't go to Farm and Fleet, we don't go anywhere and buy proof chain. Everything you get there is gonna be proof chain. 
and it is 2,600 pound rated. Uh, we use grade 70 transport every third link. Minimum has its rating on it. If you can't see the rating, it's a junk chain. If you've had one for years, uh, you know, I know you may be partial to it, but we'll give you a new one. Uh, we buy tons of chain a year because a lot of people like them at the house too. <coughs> but that is, that is, if you have a chain that has any stretches, anything like that, it is instantly junk. Uh, and we will give you new chains. But everything that we in specialties buys is grade 70 transport chain, period. Okay, and I'm, I'm sure your bosses will be happy to write the checks and buy those, like he's saying, they'll buy those chains. If you go to them and say, I feel this chain's inadequate, I want a better chain, I guarantee they're gonna be all about getting you hooked up with what you need. Um, so here, like I was saying uh, also, is that each of the tie downs must be affixed as close as practicable to the front and rear of the vehicle or mounting points that have specifically been designed for that purpose. So manufacturer may create eyelets or hooks or areas of a trailer or a uh, piece of equipment that's designed for the tie downs to go on that point. So you will want to use those points. If it's designed by a manufacturer, then it's going to be legal. Again, with some common sense, if that part of the trailer or item is damaged, that's going to negate that. Even though it was designed by a manufacturer, it still has to be solid. It still has to be uh, usable. So essentially, secure all four corners, secure articulation and accessories, and make sure you're working load limits, the minimum of half the total weight. Uh, then if you're carrying something not like an implement, but say a box, say boxes of items or wood or something of that nature that stacks up on a trailer. Um, let's, let's say you have a trailer with a header and if your items are loaded to the front of the trailer to where the item is in contact with the header, then you're going to only need one tie down for the first 10 foot of item. Uh, for each additional 10 foot section beyond that, you will need another tie down but it doesn't have to be 10 total feet. Uh, so if, let's say you have an item 15 feet in length up against a header. You'll have one tie down for the first 10 feet. You'll have an additional tie down for those other five feet. So that will have two tie downs on it. If you have a 20 foot item against the header, you're gonna have a, a, a tie down for the first 10 and a tie down for the second 10. You wanna make sure that it's front and rear, that you don't put the tie downs right in the middle or just within the first 10 feet. Those 10 feet sections um, or less have to have the tie down within them and not spread out to where there's a 10 foot section without a tie down on it. Without a header you need two tie downs on the first 10 feet so if your item is not up against a header now that goes for if there's not a header at all or if there's two inches of space between your item and the header if there's any space at all between those you're going to need two tie downs for those first 10 feet and then any feet after that up until 10 needs an additional tie down. So a 30 foot item, not against a header, will need four total tie downs. Two for the first 10 and one for each additional 10 after that. Uh, and after beyond the 30, if there's two feet more, that two feet is gonna need a tie down also. Up until 10 and then you're gonna need another tie down for every 10 foot section after that. Again, if this brings up questions or anything of that nature, let us know. <coughs> Um, so then we just get to what I like to cover with uh, what I was saying with was post crash inspections um, liability wise and stuff Dave was touching on is that when these crashes happen they may have absolutely nothing to do with what you did on the roadway. You could be in your lane traveling the speed limit using your signals, you're not tailgating, um, you're having due regard for others but as we know there's many 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 drivers out there who don't adhere to those rules and so you may be crashed into. Uh, an accident may be entirely 100% not your fault, but when it happens, time stops. And the condition of your rig stops, freezes, your paperwork condition freezes, your licensing, what you put into your body for the past 24 hours, all that stuff freezes right there. There's nothing you can do about it. Other drivers, other people around you are whipping out cell phones, mentioning taking pictures. You guarantee you every single other person involved uh, and not involved in a lot of cases will, will be doing the same thing. Photographs, video, all that stuff. Things that you say immediately after the crash. This will all be documented 
And then guess who's going to show up uh, before too long? Myself or one of one of the other inspectors uh, in a in a commercial vehicle haul or something that can can be um, defined as a commercial motor vehicle or falling within those weight guidelines is involved in a, in a crash, fatal, serious injury, hazmat related, we're going to be there checking that out. So even if you're not officially in the regulations, again, for log books, maybe for your annual inspection, maybe for having a fire extinguisher or triangles on board, regardless of those things, we'll be there checking on all that stuff. We'll do an inspection and it will cover all of those things for documentation purposes. Because like Dave said, again, the hammer or Keller and Keller uh, or one of those uh, entities are going to be on the phone, in the mail, in the emails, uh, online, contacting you very, very quickly as a company and, and as a driver saying, we want a chunk of that. Um, so you're going to have to document and show, and it's going to be documented and shown what condition you were in as a driver and as a hauler and the equipment. Um, so we're going to go do our full level one. We're going to be checking brakes, steering, suspension, tires, lights. Uh, like I say, is fire extinguisher there? Is triangles there? Is the annual inspection done? Is the pre-trip and post-trips, have they been done? What are the hours? What's the condition of all of that? Is he properly licensed to haul this? Were there placards on all four sides? Were they the correct placards? Were they positioned correctly? Were they faded? Is there, what, is there something we couldn't tell? Um, because of the way it was marked. All those things will come into play and like I say before, some of you do fall within every regulation, some don't, depending on your weight and where you, where you haul um, or work. But if the federal regulations have said that large, that heavy equipment in commerce should abide by these rules, I like to throw out there, why wouldn't you do what you could possibly do? And I know Dave and the company stresses heavily the pre-trips, the annuals, all that stuff. Um, so regardless of what we enforce on the roadway, he's making sure um, that you guys have all that stuff in place because uh, these, these crashes will go out for two years down the road. And in two years, you might get a phone call to be deposed uh, in front of a couple of attorneys or sit on the stand in front of a judge and some attorneys, sometimes a jury, depending on the circumstances. And you have to attest to uh, well, a 15,000-pound uh, rig going from California to New York, according to the federal government, it should have an annual inspection done on it. But yet you weigh 20,000 pounds. Why wouldn't you have an annual inspection done on this? And you'll, and you'll have to sit there and answer why you didn't have an annual inspection done on that heavy equipment that runs the road every single day. If, if we stop you on the roadside, that may or may not be required under our official regulations. We may not enforce that with a ticket or a violation on an inspection, but you will be held under that microscope and asked, why do these big rigs have to do it, but you didn't do it? And maybe you're asking to yourself, well, how come a car doesn't have to do it or a pickup truck? And that's, that's a whole other conversation, a whole other issue. Traffic out there is dangerous. It, it all is. But you guys are more dangerous. As heavy equipment moving every single day, the, the semi-tractor trailers, the truck pulling trailers, the articulating loads, the heavy equipment, the hazmat, the, the equipment carrying passengers for buses is at another level of um, scrutiny out there on the roads. It's just how it is. So as a person who goes to work every single day and gets behind the wheel and operates all over the place with heavy equipment, why not do everything you could possibly do? Just to reiterate, guys, you know, anytime that we, anybody gets down the wheel, nobody's going out looking for an accident. We may be doing everything 100% right. Earlier this week, we had a gentleman northbound on 69, coming home, you know, doing everything proper. Just, you know, I'm sure he was bite by the speed limit, just winding down for the day going home. Feels something hit him in the back end, truck sets over, the man, because he has a wheel and, and and the capabilities to do aggressive driving and save the truck, you know, he takes control of it, puts her on the shoulder. As he's going on the shoulder, the truck comes out around him and, and just speeds off. The guy calls me on the phone. He says, hey, you're not going to believe this. I've just been hit. And the guy, because of my abilities to control my truck, my loop truck, maybe out of Bloomington, 
I was able to save the company's assets. I did good. He says, but what do I do? This guy sped off. Um, he says, you know, a little scratch and bump and nothing major. The whole front fender of this guy's truck's ripped off. The beer's ripped off. He, put, he gets out of the way in the safety, a safety area and goes up to the next exit just to see if the guy pulled over. The guy's totally gone. There's some calls with our, our safety team and myself and Dave. You know, at that point in time, because of the billboards, we never know, and whether it be EMB paving specialties, IMI, you know, it's a great big bullseye on the back of all of our vehicles. Uh, you know, even though we don't have a lot of damage, we need to report this uh, because we don't know what's going to happen in a year or two years. Um, and it just goes to show you, you just be on your way home and everything seems fine, and all of a sudden, just out of the blue, uh, somebody hits you. Thank you, Cody. <laughs> So as, as crazy as this looks, uh, I pulled over both of these trucks um, out on the roadway. These weren't crash situations. So I'm just out there patrolling, looking, and pull over a couple trucks here and there. Here, here's what I see. Um, this, this isn't something that you did your post trip and everything looked like the tire on the right there. And then you went to bed and got up the next morning. Oh, oh no, everything looks like the other two tires. That's, that's not that. Um, and again, I think Dave and the company's making sure you guys are up on that, but it, it's just awareness. This is the kind of stuff that's out there on the roadway in a lot of cases. Um, this was a crash happened in Cass County um, where the bobtail there was again doing everything right, goes through the green, he had, he had the right of way, and then the red pickup truck, truck on top uh, ran the stop sign, failed to yield actually, actually stopped at the sign and then pulled out. Uh, failed to yield, likely because of the brightness that time of day, maybe didn't see the truck, but pulled in front of it and got struck and he was killed in the pickup truck. But like I say, uh, well, I show up at the scene, do a level one inspection on that, and this is one of the things I find on a brake chamber on that tractor is uh, rotted holes in the brake chamber. So non-manufactured holes in a chamber obviously are going to be out of service. So I have to list that. and. I can't recall if there was or was, wasn't any other violations on that, but this alone, if I stopped this unit prior to the crash, I would place him out of service, which means he shouldn't be driving on the roadways. He's by law not able to be operating that vehicle, but he was, and a crash happened and someone was killed. So like I say, a couple years later, I'm notified to come give a statement to the uh, civil attorney that's involved. Uh, and almost took the stand in civil trial. However, they did reach an agreement prior to that, which means, ka -ching, money changed hands. I don't know how much money or who exactly to or from what, but I guarantee you this company was involved in it because it was shown that this truck shouldn't have even been on the roadway that day. So regardless of this gentleman failing to yield, uh, this, this unit shouldn't have been on the road, and so it resulted ultimately in the death of the, of the pickup driver but all that's going to be taken into account. And that company's on the line for what their equipment looked like the day that, uh, that their driver was involved in a crash that wasn't even his fault. And yes, it can affect, uh, obviously, braking abilities. So that's something the attorney will say, is if this is something that, that, that affects braking ability, uh, my client wouldn't have struck this rig, or at least with as much force, because this rig would have been able to get stopped sooner. We may or may not be able to say that with detail, but it's on the table and it's something that's being looked at. Um, again, something like this, I mean, you can peek under your truck and see something like that pretty easily. You don't have to be on a creeper to look up and see a, a rotted chamber or a chamber that's about to rot. Uh, that can be spotted well in advance of that happening. Um, and it does happen. These are uh, examples of brake lining condition that's less than favorable. Again, it's not something that happens overnight. This is wear and tear. We see little cracks to start with. And then we see mediums and bigger and bigger, and then they end up looking like this over time. So uh, again, you can peek over the wheel well, and in most cases, and take a peek at your lining uh, every day, much less get under the truck maybe once a week and have a look at stuff like that, um, once a week or once a month, anything to prevent something that takes months, and, or if not years, for, for a condition like that that should be caught in advance. And then a kinked air hose, uh, that's going to be an out of service there. And it's something that can happen easily, but should be noticed on a pre-trip. Just run your hand along those lines and look at them. 
Just take a look at them. That's part of your pre-trip and post-trip. You should know if a condition like that exists. Um, so miscellaneous things is just uh, obviously, and the company will have policies on this too, but uh, cell phones have to be hands-free. If your hand is on it and, it's, and it creates a distraction to you, it's going to be addressed by us. Um, up into and including, obviously, you're sitting here like this at the stoplight, uh, chatting away, or like this, putting things into your phone. Uh, sitting um, idle or stationary at a stoplight doesn't authorize you to get a phone out and start using it. Um, you're still in operation of that vehicle on the roadway, so you're going to be held accountable for uh, a non-hands-free cell phone usage. Uh, keep that out of your hands. Headsets, make sure that it's not a distraction to you. Distracted driving doesn't have to be a cell phone. It can be leaning over to pick something up, touching the radio. If you're if we can show you are distracted from driving safely or showing due regard, um, then that's going to come into play. That's going to be a factor in a traffic stop. Is pulling over on the shoulder legal to, to use your cell phone to text? Yes, if you're pulled over to the shoulder off the traveled portion and vehicles in park, you're, you're clear to use the cell phone. If you're, obviously, if you're there an extended period of time, you're going to be putting out your emergency triangles if you're, uh, you want to get off roadway completely. Uh, 10 minutes is what you have uh, on a roadside service situation before your triangles should be coming out. So up to 10 minutes you can be on the roadside uh, utilizing the phone if you're off the travel portion and in park. Out of gear, I should say. <coughs> Let's go down to, so yeah, that includes radio, GPS, log devices. If it's being used by you while operating the vehicle and you're not giving attention to the operation of the vehicle, it's a distraction and there are specific statutes that apply to that that we can utilize. Um, so the ones of you who are in the books, meaning you are either excess of 26,001 pounds or you're traveling interstate, must have the fire extinguisher. Uh, with it there, it has to also be secured and full. It has to be in the green. Uh, so if we come up to your fire extinguisher and it's loose, if it's tossed in a box between seats or something, um, or even stuck in behind the seat, if that's not secured, prevented from movement, uh, it'll be as if it's the same statute as if you don't have it. So you may as well not have it in that case as far as enforcement goes. <coughs> Excuse what me. if it's locked in its holder but buried under stuff? That's okay. It's, it's, from what I understand, it just has to be secured. I mean, define buried under stuff because if you can't access it, you, want, you want to be able to get to it. It has to be accessible. Yeah, if it's covered with things and you can't get to it, then that's, that's, that's going to be an issue, yeah. Um, and again, make sure it's full. I do frequently come across them that have been used by driver A, but then driver 2 takes over that truck and doesn't realize it's been used and it's empty. Um, so make sure it's accessible and full and secured. Then your triangles or flares, triangles have to be there, they have to be out within 10 minutes if you're on the roadside. Uh, if load's projecting out the front three feet or more, uh, or out the rear four feet or more, uh, you'll need flags or lighting to signify that. You'll need to mark that with some type of marking. Um, getting to what he said too about stuff being on the fire extinguisher, is we do open these cabs sometimes and things fall out onto the floor and then the driver takes five minutes to find his registration. Um, and it's something that is pretty easy to do before as part of your pre-trip is to find out where the paperwork is for that truck, keep it in a specific spot, know where it's at. Uh, it can be the difference of night and day on, a, on an inspection by us if we come up and it takes you five or ten minutes to find something. Or if I have to, take, if I have to write stuff down and go type things in while he's looking for something, and it may be an issue of you don't usually drive that truck. But again, part of your pre-trip inspection, I feel, would, should and would include finding out the ins and outs of the truck you're in. You're responsible for it, so you should know if the registration's in the visor, glove box, side beside you in the door. Um, make sure you can get to that stuff pretty easily when we come up and, and ask you for it. Or in a crash, make sure it's accessible. M many companies and units have just a binder that has everything in it. And I usually just tell them, I'll take the binder back. If you don't have to pull stuff out, I'll just take the binder and look through it. It usually has everything I need to look through anyway. So it keeps it simple and easily accessible. 
while you're on lights and, and stuff, can you give them what width, what weight, what height can run 24-7 during the seven days a week, uh, restricted to noon on Saturday? Can you? Can you? On vehicle height, uh, you're, uh, what, uh, let's start with width. You're allowed in width eight foot six, eight feet six inches wide. Um, if there's an permit. without yes correct without getting a oversized permit of any kind eight foot six in in width in height 13 foot six uh, with regard to width you are allowed to exceed the width on the passenger portion up to six inches um, without the permit but you are required in that case some type of marking you're going to want to mark it if it's beyond that six inches uh, out the left side, you're not allowed to extend at all, again, without, being, without getting special permits. Um, so eight foot six and another six inches is allowed on the passenger side. Uh, for our annual oversights, and this is more for the area managers and superintendents and stuff for our low boy drivers, what are they allowed on an annual oversights? How wide can we run 24 hours a day, seven days a week? With, with permits, I think 17 feet, except on the interstate. Uh, I will have him actually confirm some of that. I think that might be what he's doing now, regardless, and we'll get some of that confirmed. Uh, but let me, if anything, I'll speak to you afterwards. You can relay that to him with the exact oversized, overweight part of it. Yeah, we, run, we run our shuttle buggies, our pavers, our wideners. Yeah. I'll do a of this back at you. Okay. Now, where would you find that? I'd find it in my green book, my DOT rigs. Yep. Is that an We're, Indiana code? That is an Indiana law. Where are we going to find whether or not you can do that, yes or no? Who's, who's got a load with a permit? If you have a permit, then what you're supposed to have with your truck with you is the provisions for that permit. They will have that exact answer. That's what I'm looking for. It's a responsibility of it, for, that, for that to be in your truck, and it will have that on there. I don't have that one memorized, but that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. And, and, it, and I could get a copy of one real quick. He won't speak, but I know he knows. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll yeah, have Ross whispered in my ear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, get up, I want to draw here one minute. Guys, back to the proper documentation, going through the DOT inspection every year. Uh, we probably come up with about 10% of the whole fleet every year that's missing registrations. Uh, if you get pulled over for any kind of traffic stop, anything, an accident, and you have that out, it has to go back in the same information where it came from. Uh, because you know, we don't know how long some of these have been missing. You know, They could have been missing over half a year. And if you get pulled over and that, that there's a violation right there, and I have the proper documentation, and that will probably weigh on how either the, the inspection goes, um, so it, it's, we should be past this problem of having trucks come in that are missing that stuff and the insurance cards. Uh, also, a lot of it is shredded uh, because of leaving food, drinks, whatever, under seats. Uh, mice like to, I don't know what they're putting in registration and insurance cards, but it must make mice nice bedding and holes for mice. So uh, make sure we're keeping the cabin that cleaned out where they're not shredding all this documentation. If you get an incident out here, just say, for instance, today leaving here, and you go to reach your glove box and get that stuff out, and shred it. That's what I'm going uh, he mentioned weight, and I'll touch on that some. Um, with, uh, prior to needing a permit, is a single vehicle is allowed 40,000 total gross uh, weight pounds, um, and then a vehicle with uh, three total axles, in other words, a tandem axle vehicle, is in Indiana. Gonna, and these are Indiana state laws. These aren't the federal laws, but the uh, single vehicle tandem axle trucks allowed 54,000. Uh, a tri-axle truck, 68,000. Uh, a quad axle truck, uh, and these, uh, as you may know, are, you'd have your steer axle first and then either two, three, or four in axles in the rear on a single unit. So that quad axle is actually uh, allowed 73,280. And then any vehicle in any combination, fashion or otherwise, regardless of number of axles, is re uh, required a maximum of 80,000 pounds of weight. Um, 
like he was saying, you can get permitted to carry in excess of those weights. Um, but I want to stress when you do that to make sure you're not exceeding that permitted weight either. Uh, because let's say you get a permit for 199,000 pounds and you're hauling that 199. Um, state law says you can carry 80, but you're permitted for 199. Now let's say I stop you and weigh all 13 of your axles or so and you come out to 208,000 pounds. And I throw these numbers out there because I had one. Uh, so guess what? You're not 9,000 pounds overweight. Okay, that permit is null and void, which means now you're allowed back to the Indiana State allowance of 80,000 pounds. So you're now 128,000 pounds overweight as far as uh, enforcement of that goes. So the ticket gets written up, sent to the local uh, courthouse, and a determination gets made. That's a 10,000 upwards of 10 grand or so when you break it down by poundage. Uh, this particular gentleman was able to plead it down to just over a thousand because it was his first uh, offense of that. He didn't have a real big history with the courts or anybody else, uh, but still a chunk of change. So something to keep in mind is, as you get into permits and things to make sure you're within that permitted amount. So then, the, the, like you say in the general paperwork, your annual inspection, you want to be able to show uh, there by sticker or a document in the truck that you have the annual inspection. Um, insurance uh, paperwork to be there as well. We don't inspect insurance on every inspection, but in a crash situation, obviously you're going to want to show that. And that's a state of Indiana thing as well. Other states may require you to show insurance. Uh, we actually only do that in a case of an accident. Uh, then the fuel tax permit, if you're required that, uh, you'll want to have documentation of that as well. That'll be a sticker. It's a single side if you're intrastate, and it's a dual side if you're interstate, plus the uh, if to form document needs to be in the vehicle as well. And that brings us to questions. And again, if you choose to approach us individually, that's fine too. Uh, it helps if we need to look something up as well. license and it has to be in there and it has to be dated for the correct year the worst part we run into with a lot of this licensing is it doesn't all happen on January 1 the hazmat comes in in June the IFTA comes in in January the annual inspections we do in our off time in the winter uh, there is something some kind of regulation or some kind of licensing that needs to be done on our fleet 12 months of the year so it behooves you to check and make sure we run into the problem we try to do it make sure it's all there in the winter but we're human again same with your fire extinguishers we do an annual on them as they come through and we dot inspect them but check it every day because that inspection is only truly good for the day we do it same with our annual inspection federal law says we have to do it and we do but that's truly only good for the day we do it. Lights can go out while they're sitting there. We have a big problem in the spring with lock rot. It's set all winter and we start it up. Bulbs don't work. Brakes are, are rusty or stuck. So the beginning in the spring and every day, the daily inspections are, are critical. Have you ever heard those letters CSA? You think that yellow triangle is a good thing? Nope. <laughs> okay. So each one of those could have a yellow triangle at some point. And in fact, you've got a couple of others that are close. So what's that mean? What 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 could be bad out of that? What's that mean to me? What's that mean to EMB page? What's gonna happen? Well, I can tell you right now, because that yellow triangle came up, somebody got a letter in the mail. If it doesn't improve, what's going to be the next step? Do we know? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with your license. Somebody from the federal government or my office is going to come and start doing an investigation on the company about what's going wrong. And what do you think they're going to do? 
they're going to start to identify what's kind of led to this problem. And whose fault is it? Where does it start? How'd they get there? Does anybody know? How'd they get to that? I'd say the driver. Huh? I'd say the driver. Okay, so it starts with the driver, possibly. Do you think the driver is solely the re responsible? <coughs> A lot, all this is inspections, I could tell you, and I could go down there and I could pick out names and I could show you incidents. And I actually looked at, and I didn't do any research before I got here, but I just happened to real quick take a quick glance at your inspection data. Data. That's all this is, data. CSA is data. Finding a way to make sense of all of, of guys like Trooper Shaw here and all the efforts and, and everything that they've done. They're just data collectors is what they are. And then once the data starts looking bad, then somebody's going to come in and really start doing something. All right? If EMB Paving got, say, maybe fined $50,000, $60,000, that's fifty or $60,000 that they didn't uh, plan on spending, and they know they've got one or two guys that were the main cause of that, would you feel real comfortable about your employment status? I don't think I would. Um, they're going to try to find, you know, the root of the problem so that it doesn't happen again. You're getting ready to get into your busy time of the year, aren't you? Okay. I'm not going to leave here until somebody gives me the right answer. What's the best way to avoid violations on a roadside inspection? I need mean, somebody raise your hand. I've heard it. What is it? Okay, pre-trip inspection. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand here, but I want you to think about your daily routine. Do you really think that if I watched you do it, that I would say, and I watched your routine, do you think I would say, that was a darn good job of a pre-trip? I can tell you that's probably a large percentage of it that is not. I got called to one of these deals one time and I went, it was on a Saturday, and they had this, uh, this company basically, they had it laid out like they were gonna do, like a, it was basically a, a, a truck driver's competition. And they drove through the cones and they did all this stuff, but one of the stations was a free trip. And they, and they, they boogered up a truck on purpose, you know, to have a few things on it. And, you know, some guys found it, some guys didn't. But you know what the most comical thing of it was is, and we put them on a timer. It, it was a very generous amount of time. And I don't remember what it was, but it was a timer. But I tell you what, every one of those guys who've been driving for a long time, their pre trip looked like a monkey F in a football, I can tell you that. Okay? It was a mess. It was chaotic. Just get a system now. Get, get a habit. Maybe add to the habit. But you know what? The bottom line is do it. All right? Here's my next question. What if you find a light bulb that's out? What do you do? Fix it. Fix it. Do you, I mean, has anybody actually done that? Tell me how it works. You're getting loaded up. You're late to get to the job site, or you got to get, you got to get somewhere. <laughs> Are you going to actually spend the time to do that? Have you? No. Okay, well good. That's what the intent is. But like I can tell you, there's violations that we find, and there's a bunch of them on your profile where that didn't happen. Okay? Yeah, I'm not going to be unrealistic to think that maybe you just did hit that bump in the road because one of your competitors paid that road, not you. <laughs> and it knocked that light bulb out, and I just happened to come along and wrote it up and put it on an inspection. You think that happened, or what, do you think it was probably out before? I, I, yeah, it was probably out before, and probably will be out again. I mean, we don't stop that many guys. So we stop a lot, but we don't stop you that much to where we're gonna catch you like that. Okay, it's been out for quite a long time. How does this get better? Like pre trips. Pre trips, you get inspections. 
without violations or time just passes by. Uh, you guys got enough numbers. You're not going to just get lucky and fly under the radar and not get stopped and inspected. I can just tell you that. Okay? You're going to get stopped. You're going to get inspected. And I'd hate to be the guy that was adding to that. Okay? Because I could scroll up and I could go to my list. I could find out exactly who did what. And I got them by name. Okay? And you could go, the public can go, and you're not going to see it just like this, but you can see it for yourself. And you're not going to see the driver's names, but you're going to see just how bad, just how bad or good you are. Okay? I like to kind of put a plug in for an interesting, if any of you are on Facebook, uh, one of our troopers on the road, Brent Hoover, uh, actually has a Facebook page called Indiana State Police Commercial Vehicle Division, I think is the full title. Uh, but if you search that uh, on Facebook, that brings up a page that he maintains daily. Uh, if you like that page, you'll be following that page and anything he posts will automatically come up in your feed. Excellent, uh, very valid information. Things that he's come across, like what I've shown you here, pictures, uh, some video, um, different things that he's come across that are super informative and they are valid things. He, he gets it straight from the book and from his own experience. Um, so if there's, you know, you'll learn something new about every day. If you guys are stopped in a roadside inspection, uh, Officer Shaw has met quite a few of our people up around Peru. Um, the first thing he's going to check is your attitude. He's doing his job. You're doing your job. If you want to get in a pissing match, that's not the place to do it. Be courteous. Take what he gives you, send the stuff to us. If we feel that, that, that there is something wrong with the inspection, that, that if we were in the right, not the wrong, I have avenues that I can challenge anything. But challenging him right out there on the side of the road, all that does is make him dig deeper and deeper and deeper. You don't want to piss off the officer. That's all there is to it. On the single axle, a gross total of 40,000. What you wanna watch is axle weight. Your axle weight of that rear axle shouldn't be over 20. Um, and then you wanna also look at your tire weight rating as well. The sidewall of the tire is gonna have kilograms and pounds. It's gonna have single and dual. So uh, for example, you may have a dual set of tires allowed 9,000, a couple hundred pounds per tire on the dual set. So if you weigh I had one just the other day, 24,000 pounds on that axle, and that's what his tires were. They were like 9,800 something each for the dual set. Uh, so he was exceeding both sides by about 2,000 pounds, exceeding tire weight rating. So he had the overweight axle, and he also had overweight rating, which is an out of service violation until that can be made legal. If he doesn't have the class B CDL, that's also out of service. So that's two out of service violations, just because I put scales under you and you had 24,000 or more pounds on that axle or whatever. So that can get pretty expensive and, and a pretty big headache. Axle weights are something you want to keep an eye on. On triaxles, you want to make sure axle groups are not exceeding the weights they're allowed. It's 34,000 for a tandem axle group, uh, 50,000 for a triaxle group in a row. So if a truck is 67,000 pounds, he's under his total gross, but more than likely he's going to be over an axle weight, depending on how that's loaded on there. So just something to keep aware of. If you put a trailer on that, that's going to add more weight to those axles as well. So just keep in mind how things are positioned, how they're loaded. Um, from time to time, I'll do courtesy ways. If a, if a company contacts the post, I'll, I'll come out, put scales under them just to see where they're at, just as a courtesy appearance and weight, uh, and, and give them FYI on that before I stop them roadside and weigh them and they get in trouble. The sign says all trucks enter the scale. It doesn't say all trucks over. It doesn't say all trucks with DOT numbers. It doesn't say anything about weight. In Indiana, it says all trucks must enter scale, period. Truthfully, if they were having a bad day and I was driving down the road, it doesn't matter. They, they can literally, passenger trucks, they're not going to do it, but they can, private vehicles. But if it has an E&B sticker on it, pretty much bet you better go through the scales. Three-quarter ton, they'll probably pass you by. But we have had them blowing a scale. Had one last year in, in, in Kentucky. Had one several years ago. Uh, man's in this room. Blew the scale up on 69. Didn't know any different. And that's when I made the phone call. 
because I thought it was 26,000 and up. No, sign says all trucks. All of our F-250s, if you open the door on them, there'll be a DOT sticker that should be stuck in the inside of the door panel because they have potential to be commercial vehicles depending on what trailer you choose to hook onto that day. <coughs> It is the weight rating of the combined that makes the difference, guys. A three-quarter ton pickup is 9,000 gross vehicle weight rating. 10,000 is what makes you a commercial motor vehicle in Indiana. But if you hook on one of those rice trailers, the minimum plate weight I can get is 3,000. But now every plate says 9,000 on it. Above that, it's on a whole nother plate, but it doesn't matter. The state in its infinite wisdom did away with nine, with seven, nine, and 11,000 pound plates. My three quarter ton has 11,000 pound plate. The F 150s have an 11,000 pound plate on them. Doesn't mean they can carry it, it means that's what it says. Same with the trailers now. They did away with the three, the seven, and the nine. Every trailer says 9,000 gross vehicle weight. Now, that isn't what it can carry. Trust me, a rice trailer had a 3,000 pound plate and it's good for 500 pounds. When you will stop a truck roadside, the driver and the company operating that truck are the only entities that are affected by the enforcement. We never go to you know, Kokomo Gravel or anywhere like that where I may stop them from. Uh, if you're heavy, it doesn't reflect enforcement wise on where you pick the load up at whatsoever. The name on the ticket's gonna be the driver and the name on the inspection is gonna be driver and company. So those are the two. And when I say company, I mean the company responsible for uh, the transport of that load, whichever company is transporting that load, not who loaded it. Same with load securement. Unless you wanted to go after them civilly, we are not going to enforce a company that tied down your products improperly and then you went and drove it and we stopped you. We're not going to go to the company that tied those down and issued them fines. It's going to be on the driver and the company responsible for hauling that load. Well, I've got everybody in here and management included. I'm going to bring up crash attenuators because that has now been spec'd um, by Larry that all two lane or, or all four lane roads will have an officer and a crash attenuator on it. Unless it was hooked to a single axle dump truck at a minimum, we have not been legal pulling any crash attenuator. A one ton may have the weight capability, but it does not have the hitch capability. We just found this out ourselves it has to have a flat plate hitch with a secure panel. If it's on a Reese hitch, it is not legal to pull the attenuator. To transport the attenuator, yes. But to use it as crash attenuation, no. Minimum of 11,000 pound vehicle, and that is weight of the vehicle, not the weight rating of the vehicle. So we have been tasked to get more trucks up. We don't have them yet. We're in the process of building what will be attenuator trucks. But just so you know, until that happens, if you're gonna have an attenuator on the job, it's gotta be a minimum of a single axle, preferably with a load of sand in it. The more weight, the better, because that's the whole point is energy absorption. And there's another thing that we learned about attenuators we didn't know. The roll ahead distance on the tow vehicle in a crash with an attenuator is exactly the same as if it got hit without an attenuator. So you need a distance between you and your workers of what the roll ahead would be. You're not gonna put it on the bumper of the truck in front of you and expect it to stop. That's not gonna happen. They class attenuators by speed of impact and the highest class you can get is a class one and that is tested at 62 mile an hour with a pickup truck. There isn't nothing gonna stop a semi, guys, nothing. But if you put them out there in a light vehicle, you're looking to get the person that's in the tow vehicle hurt too or dead because it's not doing the energy absorption anymore, it's just slamming it ahead. Like anything we deal with, it's gonna fall under an officer discretion situation. We're gonna look at your situation. If you just left a spot where it's impossible for you to 
to tell there how, how heavy you are. Uh, we, may, we may or may not give you a little bit as far as writing a citation for it. It'll still be listed on an inspection as a violation. I can tell you that overweight violations don't carry with them CSA point values. Uh, so you're not issued CSA points for overweight, uh, but it's going to be up to the officer whether or not a citation is written for, for you being overweight leaving the, the load site in that manner.